and welcome to Conversations on Climate. My name is Chris Caldwell and this series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club. We carry out negotiations every day, be it with a boss, a customer, a partner or a toddler. It's a key skill in life and an area that's massively important as we tackle the multitude of issues surrounding the energy transition. With this in mind, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Kathleen O'Connor, a world leading authority on the field of negotiation. A leading light in the London Business School community, Kathleen is Faculty Director of the Executive Education Programmes and Clinical Professor of Organisational Behaviour. An award-winning author, Kathleen sat on the boards of several influential journals on the subject of organisational behaviour and conflict management. Previously a Professor of Cornell, Kathleen is a master in the art of negotiation. Much in demand, Kathleen acts as a consultant to many of the world's leading companies, including ING, KPMG, Nestle, Danon, City, PwC, Wells Fargo, and the World Economic Forum. Highly engaged in the topics of inclusion and diversity, we spoke today from the Sir John Radcliffe boardroom of London Business School. We focus on negotiations in the real world, in life and at COP27, covering topics including the power that the academics of negotiations had in Kathleen's own life. Negotiating the climate emergency, how Kathleen's ideas on negotiation can help the teams and the individuals at COP. Inclusion justice from gender to climate. The importance of authenticity, alignment and leadership. And closing advice to those interested in the field. Professor O'Connor is a compassionate, insightful and compelling speaker, a hugely respected educator and a world leading expert on negotiations. It's a conversation that you won't want to miss. Around 80% of people who listen to this podcast haven't hit the follow button. If I could ask you for a small favour, if you do enjoy our conversations, please do hit that follow button on your app. It would help us in the show more than I could possibly say. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Well, um, Professor O'Connor, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to speak to us today. It's a real pleasure, real honour and uh, delighted that you'll spend the time. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate being here. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. We could go in so many different directions uh, with this conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. Like we start off, like your expertise is in negotiation, in yeah. conflict, in leadership, in diversity, yeah. in uh, women's rights. Uh, yeah, there's a, mil a million different ways we could go. But it kind of begs the question of, well, what, is there kind of a unifying kind of theme or path yeah. sort of for your career to path? It's a so great far? question because when you sort of look at the, I've been at this a long time. When you look at all of these, you sort of say, boy, that she might be a bit of a dilettante. And I have to say, in part yes, in part no. So I have kind of pursued different interests over the course of my career, and those have changed as, one, as they do in one's career. Um, but I started pretty solidly in negotiation, and I think the reason why I started studying negotiation um, has continued. So that's the thread. So what that is is an interest in how people manage relationships mm -hmm. and how people find a sense of connection to one another that enables them to solve problems, but also in a way kind of um, soothes their soul. Maybe that's too big, but, that, but that's my idea. I like to think about how people interact with each other. Many of the themes that you have worked on in your career have been about uh, that must have had kind of personal impacts. Like you, so you, you've looked at um, issues on how best to negotiate, uh, how to how to manage teams, how to uh, kind of empower um, women in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a little, like maybe a little example of something that um, you can say from your own personal expertise that in your in your own life uh, yeah. that you, that that the learnings, the teachings, your ideas have had a positive impact on. Your yeah, own. that's a super question. So it's often said about academics that we study the thing that we're not very good at, right? That we're trying to get better at something, which is why we study it. And that was certainly true of me. So I can tell you a couple of, of brief stories. One is that the first car I ever bought was a Saturn. And if you remember anything about the Saturn, it was an American car, General Motors car, I think. It, they, there was no, you didn't negotiate. It was a, it was a, you paid sticker. You paid the sticker price no matter who you were or what you asked for, and it was sticker price. And I realized about myself in that moment that I was avoiding negotiation because I knew that women often didn't find themselves on the better end of those kinds of deals. So that was one place where I said, if I could do this better, it would make a huge difference, not only to my life, but you know, like my economic well-being, my pocketbook. So that was a prompt for how I did it. When it comes to some of the other, um, you know, I do a lot of work, as you said, and I do a lot of teaching around women in the workplace. and. 
What has struck me since I started this is that women simply don't have to wait for permissions. They just have to step into the space and take it and give their opinions and contribute to the conversation. And I think for many years in my early career, I was far less willing to step into that conversation as a younger woman. And so I think that's changed. I realized that well, I'm not sure the world is waiting for me to speak up, but but it's certainly the conversation would likely benefit if, if more people like me said more in the in the room. So mm. those are a couple of examples. Okay, and um, if we're looking at kind of negotiation as kind of fundamental part of the the human process and the human like everything we do, yeah. almost everything we do is negotiation. Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, why do you think that it is so important? Why do we like to talk so much? And oh, you know? it's a really good one. Um, yeah, this idea of talk. So first of all, right, we're social. I mean, everybody knows that we're social. And so the way we build relationships is mostly through speech, right? So that's a piece of it. I think negotiations, that's why we, we like to communicate, right? We, why many people are looking to be better communicators. Negotiation is a technology. So that's how I think about it. So let me, let me say a little bit more. Negotiation is a technology for solving problems for coming up with creative new avenues to pursue, for managing relationships. So what I mean by that is the way that I teach negotiation and the way that most people, scholars, think about negotiation is that you have a set of interests, Chris, in our negotiation, I have a set of interests, and my goal is to try to figure out how I can meet my interests at the same time I'm meeting at least some of yours so that you say yes to the deal. Because we're, right, we're, we're dependent on each other. I want to do as well as I can, but unless you say yes, there's no deal. So part of why I think about the, the power of negotiation is such an essential skill for people to have is that it's really the only way that we're going to be able to both walk away with some of our needs met and for us to be happy with the deal. It isn't just that I've won a good deal from you and I walk away thrilled. If you walk away unhappy, I have a problem on my hands, right? You're not gonna come back to me. You may not honor the, the agreement. So it's also a technology for building relationships and enabling people's relationships to continue in a constructive way. I negotiate all the time in my marriage. So I've been married for 25 years, which I do find is a bit of an achievement. Uh, hopefully we'll make it one more year. Uh, but I've been married for 25 years. My husband and I negotiate for everything. And now it's sort of its second nature. So. I'm very explicit about here's what I'm interested in, and he tells me what he's interested in. And the first, can I can I pause for a story? We were first married, and it was um, and we were living in upstate New York, very cold, very very snowy, and we were looking ahead to our January break. We were both academics at the time, and uh, where do you want to go? He said to me on holiday. Oh, that's very sweet. I said uh, I'd like to. And I was living in the, again the United States. I said I'd like to go to Miami. He's a German. He rolls his eyes and says, Miami, I don't want to go there. He says, I want to go to Montreal. In the middle of winter, it's further north than we are. So we could go back and forth at that moment. Miami, Montreal, Miami, Montreal. And we could settle in Maryland. We'd be both, we'd be eating our, you know, out of season crabs, right, in, in, in Maryland. And neither one of us is happy. And it was an early, I think, uh, lesson for me and the power of saying, why do you want that? And him saying that I want something that feels older. I want a bit of history. I want to speak a little French. He's multilingual. Why do you want to go to Miami? Like you have to answer this question. I want dancing and sunshine and drinks and all that kind of thing. No, we didn't wind up going to Maryland. We didn't wind up going to Montreal or Miami. A, 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 true story. We did go to San Juan, Puerto Rico, where he could practice his Spanish and whatever it was, see the old forts. It's that kind of thing that I think is really powerful. It's, it's being able to ask the question why, and not in an accusatory way, not a way that makes someone feel defensive, but in a way that it enables us to sort of align and, and have both of us be happy. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. A little piece of uh, you know, advice um, from the personal side. It's absolutely you know, some amazing to have. Yeah. Actually, is there kind of a few words of wisdom you give to people out there who are, say, who are like wondering, well, what is, how, what is the secret to a 25 year marriage? Like, and, and a 25 year happy marriage. Mm. Uh, it's, it's a hard thing. In this world, it's a really hard thing. You know, it is a hard thing. You know what I think? And everybody's got their own formula for success, right? Um, uh, I, there are two things one in jest and one for real. Um, the first is that I read this somewhere. It's that neither one of us has wanted to get divorced at the same time. I, maybe you've seen the same thing. So whenever he wanted to split up, I didn't. When I did, he didn't. So that's part of it. You always There's somebody who may want to walk away, but we, we keep it going. But the second really is negotiation. He's taken, he's made big career jumps, and I've made big, big career jumps. We came here as a career jump for my husband, came to London from, from upstate New York. Um, 
And we're pretty confident that if we're making a trade-off, that is the right thing to do. So when I've taken a step back in my career for, for my husband, um, uh, he's been happy. I've been happy with that. And he's willing to do the same for me. So it's all about, it really is about the negotiation, understanding what makes each other happy and trying to meet that interest, right? Trying to meet that need for happiness. I, at least that's worked for us. Mm, yeah. Right. yeah. Um, at the moment, uh, at the time of recording, yeah. uh, the biggest, probably the biggest geopolitical negotiation in the world yeah. is happening, which is which is COP 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 twenty seven. The kind of right. yeah, um, and meeting, right. meeting the parties, convention that's of the parties. Right. Um, this is a like four, something sort of like forty thousand people are there, which in itself is is an eco crime. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, this is well said. Yeah, this is well yeah. said. Um, but. Um, I, our conversation on negotiation so far has been kind of in and around, um, you know, making the other person happy and, yeah. and, and, and love. Yeah. This is a slightly different situation. How Absolutely would you categorize different. this 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 kind of massive geopolitical type yeah. negotiation? Well, it's it's a, it's in a, as you said, it's in a completely different category, and and part of the reason is because these folks are representatives, they're agents of their home countries, and. And, and there's multiple members of those teams of their home countries, how you get to 40,000 people. And so they're not only managing the negotiation at the table here and in public, but they're also representing interests of right the people they represent. And the, the folks around them on their same team, their delegation, are differentially accountable to people back home as well, right? And then there's the internal, right? negotiation that has to happen among the members of the team. And so it's just, it's much more complicated than going in yourself as an agent for yourself and having the negotiation. There's a lot, I used to do work with um, unions. I worked briefly for the United Auto Workers in the US. And so in, in labor and contract negotiations very early in my career. And th it, was, it had a kind of a similar flavor. And so what was happening in public at a, at a table like this with all these folks sitting on, across from each other on both sides, kind of staring each other down, you know, that's not where the work is happening. The work is happening backstage. The work is happening outside where the head lead negotiator here and the company rep are going to sit together and they're going to, um, yeah, be comfortable and able to uh, hammer something out. The public nature of this is what makes it particularly difficult. That is, you've got stakeholders who, who want a particular outcome. And you might actually get close to that. But anything that you say yes to or say no to at the table, if it becomes public, kind of ties your hands, doesn't it? That you have to be able to backstage iterate and argue and propose and retreat and go back again. And so you want to almost keep the public outside of that real conversation that's happening so they don't raise expectations or hold your feet to the fire. And when you walk out, you want to be able to say, you know, about the other party, they negotiated tough. Like that was a hard negotiation, but, but we're standing here together, right? You have to help them sell it back home. Um, uh, but together, we're going to make this thing go. So it's just exponentially more complicated because there are actually three negotiations, I say, going on. Mm -hmm. The formal one across the table, the one inside the team, and the implicit one that's going to happen in terms of representing your, your principles as an agent. So okay. Yeah, and possibly even a fourth one is representing yourself as, as a human and um, yeah, rep representing the family. You know, yeah, as, yeah, I mean, that's, that's exactly mm -hmm. right. I, right, as a human being, right, with children, with grandchildren, mm -hmm. with concern mm -hmm. about the planet, with a moral compass, mm -hmm. uh, you might decide that, that you want to go a different route. I, I don't envy them the task. Mm. It's it's critical. And it's really hard to make progress because, of course, there are power differentials. There are countries that are already affected by climate change, right, that, that want payments, right, that want to be made whole for other the sins of other countries. Those are hard sells back home, right? So, you know, as an American, I pay attention to those kinds of politics. And, and those are hard. I mean, there are, there are still, there are climate deniers. There are climate change deniers. It's shocking, but... <laughs> yeah, thankfully, very much the minority now. But, Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> but that is not always, I mean, that has been, I don't know how fast that has moved, but my guess is that that has been, it's moved quickly. It wasn't that long ago yeah. that one, is climate change real? And two, does do people have anything to do with it? Yeah, right? yeah. So. It was I mean, yeah, only about, I'd say five or six years ago, just a tipping point. That's amazing that just, though, just, isn't just, it? Just fell, yeah. And so, I mean, it didn't take that long. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. well, it took an awful long time. It, it happened very, like very, very slowly. And then all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. But that's how a lot of social movements are, social change. Isn't that how it happens? But, but in the grand scheme of things, I think it probably was, it was it 10 years, 20 years, 30 years of, oh my gosh, we've got a problem. It wasn't that long. And then, but people caught up very quickly, I think. I know it feels like a long time, but. Yeah. 
It's like human rights, right? There are some rights that are denied and denied and denied. And the next thing you know, they're not denied anymore. They're not allowed, right? And it's like, it's always been this way. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Until the Supreme Court sticks over in. But, anyway. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. So, 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 totally so, 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 different so, 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 issue yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, there's so much to, to, to unpack in there. Um, one, of the, one of the parts that they like, that, the big power imbalance you were talking about, um, where you've got the, the historic yeah. countries who, who have been the, um, the, ben, the, the beneficiaries yeah. of, of, of the pollution yeah. and the countries that are, that, that are weaker, more and vulnerable that are paying the, paying the price of them. How do you deal with that type of power imbalance? Like you, you talked before about the successes relative of being um, like you know tough or cooperative, yeah. like and you know generally saying sure. you know cooperative wins. Yeah. But do these smaller nations have any choice but to be tough? But to say no because it's it's an existential crisis. Yeah, it is an existential <laughs> crisis. I think there's a, several questions in there that are really really interesting. You know, one is that minorities can al minority voices, meaning numerical minorities, can always be noisier than majorities. But you have to be, right? Nobody's going to pay any attention to you. The power that you may have, this is the advice I always give, um, it, and not in those situations, but in other kinds, which is that there's the power in getting bigger. Get bigger. That means several things, and I know this is what's happening. You collude. Right, you have to actually bond together with others. You have to. You're not. You have to persuade some of your bigger polluters. I get that. Are there fence sitters? Are there some that the internal politics could go either way? Are there some countries where the Greens are, are becoming ever more powerful? You could actually pick off that country and have that country help you, whatever that 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 entity is, help you um, to get bigger and more powerful in the room, right? I mean, I'm I'm I again, I'm not as familiar with this as as I could be. I'm reading the news as everyone is, but. You know, the big polluters, China and the U.S., have got to decide they're going to sit together and they're going to make some plans. I mean, part of it is that anything I concede to has repercussions, not only politically internally, but in terms of potentially my ability to kind of keep up, to grow my economy, whatever that is. So I really need the big countries, right, to be able to club together and say, we're going to agree to something like this that's going to help the small ones. The small ones themselves, I don't think, have a lot of leverage. It's about the big ones realizing that the time is now and that they're all going to take a hit. They're all going to say yes to this, um, whatever that yes, whatever that thing might be. That's how I would think about it. So either you're going to collude among yourselves and get bigger and then pick off some of your mm -hmm. powerful countries that are willing to make these changes. And then that becomes a very large coalition that might be able to influence the big polluters in, through other means, mm -hmm. right? Just as you say, that one kind of really great example of, yeah. of a small country that is making a lot of noise is Barbados, mm. uh, where um, your very charismatic uh, leader, um, female leader, uh, was was did, did the keynote opening and just opened her heart. And mm -hmm. it was, wow. Yeah, bravo, yeah bravo. inspirational. Yeah, really inspirational. And, yeah. and everybody in the room like sat, sat up and, and took, took yeah. out us. Like, it's, you know, yeah. where if, if you have like really inspirational leader, yeah. leadership, can. You, know, you, can, you can have open. You know, what I, what I would think about is the inspirational, especially in this day and age, right? The inspirational leader could, in, really can inspire the 40,000 delegates. What's important is that that, be, that gets on social media. And then that becomes the kind of thing that a younger generation, for instance, in the US of voters says, I want these kinds of policies, not those kinds of policies, right? I'm challenging whether the way we've always done it is the best way to do it going forward, right? So I would imagine that the, the benefit of that inspiration is not per even particularly in that room, although it might be. It's where else it goes and what who sees it and whether they have power either on their own or in, in, in groups to be able to affect the internal politics, mm -hmm. right? Now, it's unlikely to happen in places like China, but it could very well happen in the United States, right? Where this voting block that younger people are voting in, in larger and larger numbers than we've seen before, and they become very powerful advocates for change. My own sons, I, you know, my own sons are in their early 20s, and, uh, you know, I, I don't talk to them very often about this, but it's come up, they don't want to have children. Right. There's a oh, whole generation of kids awful. who say, yeah, it's not just my kids. Like there, there, there is a generation out there that says, I'm not sure if I want to have children. Like, I don't know that the planet can take it. I don't know what the future is going to be. I might adopt children. Right. That kind of thing. But there's a, a different sense of their role in the world um, and their responsibility for the world. And um, yeah, I, I think it's very, very interesting. So actually, it's not only this marvelous speech from this from the leader of Barbados, but where else it goes and what it enables, right, in these home countries where people can, you know, protest. Mm -hmm. I don't know about, yeah, there's just oil here in this country, right? I walked, I was in Trafalgar Square just a couple of weeks ago and there were, there they were, right, snarling up, you know, Trafalgar Square and, and you know, it's inconvenient. But most, you know, most public public protests are inconvenient. That's the point of the public protest is to draw the attention, right? Get people yeah. to say, what is just oil about? 
right? Is that should I? Yeah, should I be driving my car all the time? Right, kinds yep. of things. Yeah. Yeah, and the, uh, the the pouring soup over a, over a, over a, a great work of art. That looked at well, somebody's attention. Yeah, well, they knew that there was glass on the front of it. Like it wasn't going to be. It oh, wasn't. Fair enough. Yeah, it wasn't going to be going to be damaged in any way. But they it get wasn't damaged, they, they get yeah. they get worldwide media attention. Yeah. You know. This is how, exactly right. Right. This was the old days of Greenpeace. Right. Scaling different right um, buildings. This is right. You want people to sort of say, what is that, and why are they doing it? And I think sometimes the the, the point of, of these kinds of movements and these kinds of protests gets lost because people mm. like, well, why would I be on your side when you're snarling traffic? It's not really about you, the driver. Yeah, but it, yeah it's making you. It's making you think about it. It's, it's just yeah. It is yeah. making news. But, uh, anyway, also on on on, on on other difficult topics, yeah. um, and without kind of particular naming names because yeah. you, you go into all sorts of sorts of sure. rabbit holes. But how do you deal with with like with countries, big, powerful, important countries yeah. that that hold out that are just yeah. that for their own own reasons are saying no and snarling at the process? Yeah, that's where the negotiation piece comes in. I don't have anything. Um, I can tell you the kind of way that I think about this. I had a, a guy, a, a, a co-author many, many years ago now who was very interested in environmental questions, environmental disputes. He's a negotiation professor, very interested in these disputes. Max Bajerman, several years ago. And he's been doing this kind of work for, you know, 30 years, 25 years. And uh, he would talk at the time, it was not a very popular word, I don't think, but he would talk about pseudo-sacred issues, that there are issues, are they sacred issues? Or are there, what would it take to get you to say yes to this? And I think that's how we need to think about negotiations. So are there going to be intransigence? There's only so many tools I have to kind of unstick the process. But one question you could ask is, under what conditions might they say yes? What would it take to get them to say yes? Now, there might be some who say, every tree you know, is like cutting off my own limb. I don't want to say goodbye to any of my trees. But the truth is, what if I planted 10 times that number of trees somewhere else? Would that make a difference to you? Would you say yes under that condition? So again, I don't know if there's much brilliance in this, except to say, under what conditions might you say yes? And then some of it might be, if everyone else says yes, I might be more likely to say yes. So they may be the last mover in the process, right? That we don't necessarily want to start with our most intransigent um, group. We want to start with our with people who will say yes to change, then those who are on the fence, who are willing to be persuaded, or are able to point to another like country and say, well, if they're doing it and they're able to do it, let's watch them, see how they do it. If it's successful, now we'll do it. Now you're building kind of a coalition of the willing, right? And then at the very last, you may not be able to get that other country until the very last round. There is going to be someone who comes last. There is a country that will decide last. We want that to be sooner rather than later. But I think some of the questions are under what conditions? What can what can other countries bring to the table that would make it attractive for that country to say yes? Or what kind of pressures can they apply that would make it attractive, more attractive to say yes than to continue to say no? Yeah, yeah on the purely economic side, yeah. if, if the problem is um, a very significant portion of your national income is coming from oil and gas, and we need to keep that in the ground, it's a really, really difficult thing for, for, for any country of that basis to say, yeah, okay, to. I, I understand that. I, I get that. that. <laughs> but, I get it. I think yeah. that that's right. If, if you have an economy that's built on that resource, I understand that. At the same time, you know, there are states like California and the United States that have now banned gasoline engines coming up in five yeah, years' yeah, time. Five, right? Yeah, very good. California is one of the biggest economies in the world you get some economies that are going to stand up and say, we're not going to enable this anymore, whatever they might be across Europe. And and it sort of becomes, having gas in the ground is not that appealing anymore. It's not a very helpful resource, right? So now you're going to have to think about something else. So I think when smaller, and this is, again, this is Gavin Newsom. He's not a world leader. He's a, he's a governor of California. He stands up and says with the legislature, we're not going to have these anymore. That kind of reduces the power of the companies that are sitting on oil and gas, right? It's just a matter of time before the world moves in a very different direction. And now whatever power you had is gone. So the question is, are there benefits you can extract from the rest of the world, maybe to help you transition away? You know the end is coming. Can you transition away to something else and sooner? That might be, again, the way to think about it over time. The world is not static, right? Obviously, it's very dynamic. And so you start to, and I don't know if, if, the, if, the, if the California decision got a lot of play, but I thought it was brilliant. Companies, sir, companies need to know what's coming one way or the other, and then they know what to produce. And so now they know that if they start, if they stop producing that kind of engine and they start producing something else, cars with that engine, 
then they'll get more sales in California. It's it's the predictability that makes a difference. So if a few countries and states stick their necks out and say, we're going to do that this way, then companies have a reason to make more, mm -hmm. right? Energy efficient or electric vehicles, right? I, 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 I mean, it's probably not quite that simple, but the predictability makes a difference. It's the unpredictability that companies don't know what they're producing for whom and, and how much, yeah, right? Yeah. It's that kind of thing. Yeah, and there's other things um, like purchase, just some thoughts. Um, yeah. In... Let's say Saudi Arabia, there's a lot of um, solar resource there. There's a lot of desert. Yeah. So maybe there was some, some, there's some, some kind of arrangement to be made where turn off some of that and we'll, we'll build some of this and, you know. Seems to, no, but, 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 I, but I don't think that that's, I, I don't think that you're wrong. I mean, one of the things that we, that we know is coming is that, you know, countries that have a lot of sun or a lot of wind or whatever the next thing is going to be are going to win, right? Because they become also super independent. So it's a great study about... Um, wind in Texas and California, and one state was much more likely to invest in the alternative, and the other one was less likely. But it was you got to kind of put the money where the wind was. And there's great vast expanses in Texas that are quite windy. Put the, put them in there, yeah. right? Yeah. And Texas has been doing some great work on the renewable Amazing. side, which is like really like ten years ago you never imagined it, but it's stunning now. It's Amazing, like, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. So I, I think that there. So so you're right. What would it take to get them to switch? And maybe. I'm not sure that they haven't thought about that, right? There's a reason why so many of these countries are hosting sporting events and why, right? And building eco-friendly cities and all this other kind of stuff. It's like, you're going to have to diversify your economy because, um, yeah, because it's not clear how much longer people are going to want that particular resource. So one of the most striking images of, uh, the, of COP so far, probably the most striking image, is the, is, is the, um, the picture of all the world leaders. Um, and uh, the caption that just went around the world was, was you know, notice who's missing. Right. Um, massive lack of gender diversity, like really stunning lack, lack of gender, gender diversity. Um, do you think that that is in some way, you know, responsible for the impasses? Do you think that we'd see a better solution with with, with better gender diversity? Or is that, is that all just a stereotype? No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> there's a little bit of nugget of truth to that. So, you know, it doesn't look that different from other photographs of powerful gatherings, right? I mean, I, my guess is that any board, you know, any big board of any big, large organization, you might get one or two, but you never get more than that when it comes to gender diversity or racial diversity or socioeconomic background diversity, right? So it's almost like there's a quota in companies that says, once you get two or three, don't get any more. Like you'd never see, you know, eight women sitting around the table. Um, uh, would it be different? There are studies in political science. My husband's a political scientist that show that the more women you have in a legislature, the more you get legislation passed that is friendly to issues that women care about. By the way, women care a lot of issues, right? Including economic issues. So they do, it, it doesn't matter what party they're from. So there is some evidence to this point that, that you were making about if there were women, would it change the conversation? There are situations where you say it does change the conversation. It, change, it changes legislation to have more women who are leading because some of their interests just look very different from some of the men that get elected. So yes, do they negotiate differently? I mean, that's another issue. I think that's another question. Um, yeah, it depends on the context. You know, there are some contexts that stereotypically do not advantage women and some situations where women are, um, are more likely to win the, win the negotiation. I can tell you a little bit about this. Women systematically do better in negotiations when they go in representing someone else. Women are notoriously bad at representing their own interests at the table. Mm. Notoriously bad at this, which is one of the reasons why when I teach women's programs on negotiation, which I do here, I say negotiate for yourself as though you're negotiating for someone that you really cared about. They're very good when it comes to representing families, teams, organizations. They're very good. They're, they're fierce in the negotiation. They will be well prepared. They will go to battle. They will, they want to get as much as they can for the person that they represent or the group they represent. They are unbelievable. And this is empirically true. When women negotiate for themselves, however, they're notoriously bad at it. Men will almost always outperform them. I think in part, I think there's a hundred reasons, but one is that women are just a little bit less comfortable. Um, uh, what is the word? Bragging about their own achievements, bragging about their accomplishments. There is a tendency, and I think it's been socialized in women, to put your head down, do your best work, and someone will notice you and promote you. And that's not actually the way it works, right? You're going to have to stand up and make an argument for yourself and make sure people know what you're doing and how you're doing it. But there's a lot of data that suggests that actually um, it would behoove more people to have more women negotiating on their behalf because they will come in tougher, to some extent more creative. They're far less likely to let the conversation 
um, drift. So is that helpful answer to your question? Would it be different if there were women? I think there probably would be different if there were women. Yeah, um, but that doesn't sound like it would be, you'd be more likely to get a positive outcome. Just from the, from the way you framed it there, that that's that you know you just have have basically, basically two two tough guys, so, you know, so, two tough so, individuals bashing off against each other. Fair enough. Yeah. That's a really good insight. <laughs> to the extent that they know this the the secret to negotiation, which is creativity, they would be better off. So a well trained woman, I would argue, is probably going to be the winner at the table. What it, what it should do, I study self efficacy. I study confidence in negotiation. And the more confident you are, both in your ability to be tough, which is part of which, but also your ability to be creative and uh, work with the other side, it predicts how well you do in the negotiation, how well the other side does in the negotiation. So it's not just about banging over the other person over the head. It's finding space where we can find some trade-offs that benefit both of us. So if women are well-trained and know that about negotiation, they can go in and come up with really brilliant deals because it's not about banging the other side over the head. Because then you don't have to negotiate. Then it's just whoever's more powerful wins. Because that's all you're really doing is you're convincing the other side that you're more powerful so they have to make concessions to you. It's about finding the, the white space. It's about finding what you really care about. It's about discovering that you want to see some, you want to spend your holiday in a place that has some history and where you can speak another language. And I want to be in a place that's got sunshine and, and, and great drinks. And then you say, oh, let's put that together. Now we can find something that works, right? Anyway, so, so they'd have to know that. Not just about it's not just about being tough on the other side. It's being tough on the problem. Okay, um, we've also got a problem with COP and in like the sheer sheer number of people around the place. Um, is there a necessary trade off in something like this between you know the democracy of the whole situation and the effectiveness of the, of the of the negotiations? If there's if we're talking thousands of people versus two or three parties. Um, yeah, but but I think that COP is serving multiple. Right, multiple masters, as it were, right? There, it brings it world attention to an important issue, which has got to be part of the big reason why COP is, and it gets a lot of attention these days. I don't know, this is COP 27. I don't know what COP 1 was like or COP 2 was like. I don't remember hearing about it. I could have been distracted by other things in my life, to be honest, but but I think that it, it focuses world attention on these issues. It gives the sort of um, citizens of countries around, you know, whose representatives are there um, to get a platform to be interviewed by the national news, to be interviewed for, for top stories in, in the big papers of the day. I think that that is part of what's so, so important about COP. Yes, it's also about what comes out of that in terms of the negotiation. My guess is that most of that is being done in the back rooms, right? It's being done out of the public eye, as we discussed. I don't know that that's true, but you'd be better. You, I would imagine that that's what's happening because it's very unwieldy to actually get anything done with it. I mean, you have more than, what is the Amazon rule? No team bigger than can, two pizzas can feed or something along those lines. You're not gonna get anything done. I looked down our table, our beautiful table. We would get nothing done if every seat in here was filled, right? We'd never make a decision. So I think there's probably multiple reasons why we have COP27 and it's gonna, you know, anyway, it's gonna yeah. satisfy. Yeah, no, so, so, yeah, that's that's exactly right. You do tend to have um, large amounts of delegates talking yeah. about what's happening, and then the leaders flying in, having uh, back, uh, you know, back in the background conversations, yeah. and coming up with very late in the day, but sometimes very surprising outcomes, like things that weren't, but that just weren't in the public domain, They're weren't being talked about, and just yeah, just just pop out, and somebody gets creative. Yeah. I think that that's true. I hope that that's what it is. I would argue that once you have a conversation, and, and by the way, I understand that this is not, Joe Biden is not sitting with Xi and the two of them are coming up with really great ideas for what they can do, right? They're very well briefed. Other people are actually leading, the, the, the delegations are actually doing the hard work. But even that is a back room, right? Even that is, we're gonna sit together as the heads of these delegations and have the conversation. But you do hope that in that conversation, there is something emergent. You know, I didn't realize that or say a little bit more about that, which is so much of how good agreements are reached in negotiation, right? We come in with a set of priorities. You come in with yours. I come in with mine. Sometimes they overlap. Sometimes there's there's room in there. You've got your own that I don't, I'm not aware of. And what we come out of it with is a very different understanding. I now understand very differently what you're what you're interested in and where 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 your lines are. You know, I mean your lines look different from mine. What I'm able to do as the, you know, as, as, as the prime minister in the UK is very different from what the German chancellor could achieve necessarily, or a, it's different, right? Because we've got different constituencies. Our elections are at different times, you know, parliamentary systems are different from direct, right? Election kinds of systems. One of the biggest 
challenges that uh, that the cops face yeah. is well, as you said, well, you, you didn't, you hadn't really heard of one or two. We're now on twenty seven. How, how much further ahead are we really? And, and like from from twenty six to twenty seven, with all the great promises, twenty six yeah. and twenty seven, there's been there, there's it carries a lot of baggage and it a lot does. of weights. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of sense of. Kind of deflation and failure. There's some optimism that comes out, and people at the end of it go, oh, "It's amazing." But actually, ultimately, there's 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 always a sense that we should have done more, and we 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 had of um, we we had to have done more, and we're now further behind than we than we than we could be. How do you get over that type of um, like? The impasses, like when when you, yeah. you you you've sat you've talked before, you haven't managed to manage to get to to get to a big breakthrough, yeah. and then you're sitting down again. It's hard. I think you're dealing with human beings. They may be delegations from different countries, but they're human beings. And I think, you know, you know, first of all, you have to lower your expectations, which I know is really hard for this group, right? Because everything rides on this. It's very hard to say to someone who's passionate and whose life work is, is in this area to say, I don't think that the that the that the best that the outcomes are really going to come out of COP twenty seven. I think that I think the outcomes are going to come from somewhere else. And they're probably going to be, and I might be wrong about this, but my guess is that you know, again, a leader comes home and a leader like Joe Biden comes home and this issue that COP has raised is on the front pages and then activists and other groups, not for profits, grab onto it and they try to push that agenda and they're working through their own legislatures, they're working through their state governments. That It is glacial. It is glacial um, because no one leader and no one delegation is able to go back and say, we're going to change all these kinds of things, right? That it's small bits of legislation. I mean, frankly, to be really frank with you, is it governments that are going to make these differences or is it companies? Isn't it companies? I mean, here's my thinking about meaning, meaning what? Meaning follow the money. You know, when a, when a bank decides, a, an equity firm decides we're no longer going to be investing in these kinds of things. When CalPERS, California Pension, decides we're no longer going to be investing in these kinds of technologies or we're no longer going to be investing in these firms, well, that makes things happen, right? When a company says we are no longer going to be um, in this product, we're going to have to diversify or we're going to, we're going to um, divest of this product, things happen. I actually, there's a lot more attraction to be gained from companies than there is from governments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but part of the reason that I think like this type of yeah. thing is useful is because well, we're talking to uh, to LBS yeah. alumni, we're talking to other yeah. alumni, we're talking, you know, trying to trying to talk into the C-suite yeah. and getting people to to think about yeah. you know, these types of issues. And if you can, 100%. you know, be influencing those pe people people in business, then there's that's there's, where the there's, action is going to happen. Mm. I mean, we're talking about COP. You know, one of my favorite. But uh, one of my favorites is the World Economic Forum, mm -hmm. right? Which is sometimes you're like, these guys, I mean, that's uh, another one where these rich people fly in and destroy the planet on their private planes coming back and forth. You know what it's like. And you sort of say, what's coming out of that? And I think there's a lot of work that goes on, but it's not by, you know, Jeff Bezos isn't going to get the work done, right? That the, the, the big speakers aren't going to get the work done, that there are there is work that goes on in a place like the Forum, and I'm assuming it's COP27, that happens all year long. It has nothing to do with it. The event is a way to attract attention, and it's, in the case of World Economic Forum, I would argue, it's a, it's a reward for the companies that are ponying up the cash to do the studies, right, to do the research and to actually um, in, in, enact the plans. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that goes on, but it does feel glacial, and it particularly feels glacial, I think, to, to people who are passionate about the issue. Um, the fact that there were, I mean, I, I, there were climate, I've talked to climate deniers in the last, like, you know, t 10 years ago. This was not, well, there might be climate change, but it's not man-made. Right. Uh, okay. Right. Um, to me, you, you sort of said, well, that's not very fast. I think it's incredibly fast <laughs> that we can change people's perceptions like that. But but I understand that when the climate when the planet's on fire, it doesn't feel like it's fast enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think just to kind of to to wrap up the the, the cut yeah. part of the conversation, I'm really interested in digging a little bit more about impasses and how you know the kind of research that you've done on how even if the people around the table change, if there's been a history of of, of failed process and failed discussions, and you know. Outcomes are on average much worse. Yeah. Like, how do you break that? Can, can you reset that? Do we need something entirely different to COP? Do we need to start at COPP one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a really good question. It's a really nice insight, actually. So you're right to say that the, that the research suggests that if you've had an impasse, 
it, it doesn't matter what negotiation comes next, you're going to come out of the gate tougher and more competitive. That's the instinct. It's like, well, if only I were just a little bit firmer, I could have gotten there faster. So it is a danger because you get into these what we call distributive spirals, right? These pa- these spiral patterns. Um, so how you break out of it really mean, and these are this is just this is a human bias. It's just a bias. It's just psychology. So you can only fix it through psychology. I preface this because it's going to sound so bland, but it's you do have to change up the space in which you're doing this. You do have to um, do a little bit of work on yourself. So one of the interventions that we came up with for this was for folks to remind themselves of a time when they were successful in their negotiation. I know it seems so silly, doesn't it? It's a priming kind of experiment. So here's why you do it. So, so what you do is you just have them write, remember, recall a time when you were really successful and get a breakthrough negotiation could be any kind of negotiation. You have people write about that for five or 10 minutes. A few things happen. One is that they unstick themselves psychologically. They start to think about themselves as someone who's a good negotiator. And that's really powerful because with that confidence, our studies show that confidence makes an enormous difference in how you negotiate. The second is that you remind yourself potentially of a tactic that you used. You also get out of the frame of thinking about how much you dislike this difficult person across the table. And you remember that you have the skill to be able to reshape how they think about the world. So it's a very small intervention. But actually, I, I when I teach negotiation, I have people do this all the time when they've had an impasse in the past. And I say, OK, so this time, I want you to think about a time you had a breakthrough, really positive breakthrough creative negotiation. And then they go in and I say, okay, what will you do differently? And I also have them fill out a little, really brief little questionnaire where they say they will be more creative this time. They will ask more questions. They will pause more, whatever it is. They will really think about what the other person is saying. And it makes a difference how well they negotiate. Great. I don't know. I don't know. It is a, it's a confidence. It's an efficacy intervention. But in fact, if I can say one more thing about this. Confidence is really critical, not just confidence. I'm a, I can be tough when toughness is required, but I can be creative. And creative is almost always required in negotiation. And, uh, and it was more powerful as a predictor of how well people did than almost anything else you could measure. So for instance, their personality traits, their Machiavellianism, their gender, their um, physical attractiveness, those are all possible predictors of how well people do in negotiation. Confidence is the number one driver of how well people do. And by the way, I'm not saying ability. I'm saying one's confidence, one's ability is the is the big is the strongest driver of outcomes. That explains a lot, actually. Does it? <laughs> but it can be quiet confidence. It doesn't have to be this. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It can be quiet confidence. I, I'm thinking about recent political leaders in our nations. But <laughs> oh, I can imagine. It was, it was this kind of thing. Yeah. It's not just the Over. toughness. It's the creativity. It's the ability to kind of pause and think. Negotiations are incredibly complex, right? That I'm not only trying to explain myself to you. I'm trying to remember to ask you why you want something. And then I'm trying to listen when you say, well, what do you have in mind? And I'm writing it down. I mean, trade agreements, you know, trade negotiators, international trade negotiators often do this, right? Where they sort of come up with a, like a straw man, right? Here's a starter for 10. Is that the British expression? Here's a starter for 10. And then you just start tearing it up and tearing it apart. And it becomes less about the two of us having an argument and more about what could we do to improve this document? Nobody's going to make a pledge to do it. We're just going to see what we need, you know, how we're going to get a, move a little bit, move the needle forward a little bit. And again, the move the needle forward a little bit may not be satisfactory if the planet's on fire, but it is a way to kind of advance the negotiation. Mm. And you have to build. It's always advancing it to a steady place where then you can keep building and keep building and keep building. Mm. Well, it seems like the the non-talented or at least if talent isn't, isn't a prerequisite, that sheer confidence isn't going to get you an, an optimal outcome. Like, Misplaced confidence is definitely not going to get you a great outcome. So it really, so let me be a little bit more specific. It's about confidence in a set of skills. It's not about um, a general sense of confidence. So maybe that's hair splitting and it's, and it's a little bit researchy and a little bit sciencey, but but I think it's worth saying. It's a belief that I have I can be creative when creativity is necessary. And I think it's actually creativity that wins the day in most negotiations. If I know what your interests are and I know what my own interests are, and I know what your constraints are, I know what my constraints are, what the backstops are, it's just it's just our imaginations now that are gonna that are gonna power the day. I can say, well, what about this and what about this and what about this? You know, it's that old idea about saying yes and. It's that old idea about yes and. And the yes and keeps the conversation going and it helps you reach for something and I say, maybe. You say, okay, under what conditions could we make this work? And that's a creativity exercise. That's not a 
no exercise. You know, what we want to do is we don't want to narrow the space between our positions. You make a demand, I make a demand, and we baby step our way to the, the midpoint. We're in Maryland, mm -hmm. right? To go back to my earlier example. What we want to do is we want to expand the possibilities, broaden the possible options. Well, what would it take? And not to, and not to dismiss an idea too quickly. What if we paid for this? And what if we, we could get this country to work with us and we could supply this? Or what if we could get this country to supply something more cheaply to us and that would mean at better terms for the next five years and that would mean we would stop producing this other thing? You know, it's that kind of open kind of conversation and creativity that matters. Sometimes it's not about the two of us. or the, It's about getting the third party and the fourth party and the fifth party to say, what are we all bringing to this, right? What are you going to trade here? And what are you going to trade there? And I'm sure that's what COP is, that's what they're mm. doing at COP. So if I may suggest then that, that there'll be more, uh, you need a really good facilitator, a really good, good, good um, manager of the, of the whole ecosystem. Yeah. As opposed so it, there'll be some people who will be open and creative, and creative um, but they may be seen as competition. They might, they might, they might be listened to. Yeah. It's like, would the power be in an independence? Yeah. It's an amazing. It's amazing what somebody can do. I mean, it's like a, you know, it's like when people have a go through a divorce and they've got, you know, it's a divorce mediator. I mean, the mediator isn't going to help you do any. They're not going to give you the suggestion. But you can vent to a mediator. You can complain to a mediator behind closed doors when your spouse isn't there. You can, they can sort of bring a proposal to you and it feels a little safer because it isn't your spouse. You're saying no to everything the spouse says. There, and I love, so I love the insight about bring a facilitator. Um, and it's not a mediator. It's, it's simply someone who can say, who can step back and say, I think you've got, there's something happening here. Or this feels like a dead end. What if we tried something like this, right? You put it up on the wall and you right and again you brainstorm around it it becomes very personal doesn't it i mean there are this is a this is a as you said it's an existential issue this isn't just well you know wh whether you're going to knock a thousand pounds off of my used car i mean this is people's lives are at stake and um and i think that that emotion that passion is critical right to making some change happen it can also be an obstacle to really seeing a good a good enough solution what is a good enough solution for this, for the next two or three years? What's a good enough solution for the next five years? Um, because nobody ever gets what they want out of the negotiation, right? You always have to make the compromise. The question is, you know, knowing ahead of time how much compromise you're willing to, to take mm -hmm. um, and staying at the table long enough to make that happen. I, I'd be curious to know, I've, I, I've never done the, I don't know who has the data on this, but, but the relationships that get formed during COP and where they wind up, right? Where they end up and all the small things that may be agreed to that we're not privy to, right? Now that the climate becomes hotter every single day, right? Again, it's not fast enough. But my guess is that there are some good conversations and there's some projects that happen. There are some decisions that get made. Mm -hmm. Again, why did, and I'm sorry if it's not a good example, but it's the one that I know, you know, why did Gavin Newsom decide that they were going to make this, that they were going to pass this legislation in California about engines? My guess is that there were some special interests, right? There were some advocates. He was already kind of open to the idea. He thought politically he was going to win more, right? I, he might have gotten donation. I mean, I don't know. what, But something moved because that was not the policy in the state of California. So it's possible to move. But you got to figure out what moves people. Right, you have to figure out, you have to know enough about what they're dealing with back home, where the, the other issues are, mm -hmm. right? To know what's gonna, where you've got some leverage. Um, if we can move on a little bit, a little bit now to issues which are kind of important for the broader sense of kind of sustainability. Yeah. It's more mm -hmm. about um, you know uh, justice and yeah. uh, what's like climate justice is is, is yeah. one of, one of, one of those conversations around. But you've been a kind of big uh, champion of, of inclusion. Can you give us um, an example of how something that's really surprised you in inclusion in exact ed, and have you broadened out the amount of you know yeah. the, the, the people and scholarships and whatever else that you've you brought broadened the classrooms? Yeah. How has there been any kind of real real wonderful? Oh, that was a wonderful moment. I don't know. Let me let me share with you yeah. some of the stories, and then um, and and I think that there are some really good. I, I think there are some. So we work with the Thirty Percent Club. And, you know, Thirty Percent Club is all about getting more women to s seats on boards. Thirty percent, they would agree, is very low. Why can't it ever be 100%, right? This is the old Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? Line in the Supreme Court. When will there be enough women sitting on the on the nine panel court? And she said, when there are nine, right? Um, so there you go. So so 30% is probably not enough, but it's, but it's a good start. So we've partnered with them or they've partnered with us and they um, award scholarships to, to women. Um, I'm on the committee for that, who are highly qualified, quite ambitious, 
and have their eyes set on board roles and C-suite roles. And so they've been able to support some of those women who are looking for, you know, because our programs, particularly the very senior programs, are premium programs, right? There's wonderful transformation happens and they're pricey. And so I've then had the opportunity to teach those women when they come through those programs. And the conversation is is rich. Their contributions are very interesting. I think they're extremely well informed. And I think that they feel a sense, and I shouldn't overstate it, but but a sense of gratitude for the opportunity. And they're very active. I was on the phone today with one of them who had, who had gotten this award a couple of years ago. She and I are doing a small research project together. Very interested, very keen to change the way women are seen at work, right? A very successful woman. Anyway, so so do we see that there are benefits of, of being more inclusive and being more creative about how we create that inclusivity in the classroom? I think absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I haven't recently, but, you know, probably 10 years ago, I remember working with a company, um, a, a company from overseas, and they sent 50 delegates to their executive education program, and there, were, there was one woman. I mean, I, I don't even know where to start, you know, and half the faculty are women who are standing there in front of them. And, and you know, you try to say, do you think you're making the best decisions? I mean, anything, right? Do you, are you have enough diversity of perspective? Do you have enough? Are you listening? Are you bringing too many biases to your decision making? What has created this situation? And of course, some people say, what's, what, what's the problem? Um, and I'd say, well, Right. Where are the women? And my, my concern, especially at the top of the organization, is that if there aren't enough women up there, then what I'm seeing is that men are overrepresented. And that actually is the way I'd like to talk about it. Men are overrepresented at COP27. Men are overrepresented at the top of the organizations. If they're overrepresented, then I'm a little nervous that we've got some mediocre men who are standing in for the really brilliant women. You know, there is research on quotas. I know people don't like them. I mean, they exist on the other side, right? Once we get two or three women, that's enough, right? And I don't think we ever say it, but it's a quota. You know, people don't like quotas, but they're actually really good sorting mechanisms. So the research suggests that when you have a quota for women, what winds up happening is that um, in this particular company, more women stepped forward when they made this change. There would be quotas for the number of women at the top of the organization. More women, qualified women stepped forward for additional training programs to improve their leadership skills, and mediocre men stepped back. So people actually self-selected. Once there's a quota and women said, oh, it looks like I could get promoted, they made the rational decision to invest in their resources. When the quota came in, some of the men who would not really be in contention for these positions said, well, never mind then, right? It looks like they're gonna have more women at the top of the firm. I would argue that wasn't a bad sorting mechanism, right? The company is able to invest in the people who are ambitious and really want it um, and didn't have to invest in other people who are saying, sure, I'd love to try it, right? Why not? There's a lot of men up there. You know, that representation matters. Yeah, and yeah. Um, and but, quota was a way to kind of let people know that you have a spot there. The yeah. spots will exist for you if you invest in yourself. Otherwise, women are rational by saying, never mind, I'm not going to bother. Yeah, yeah. But you know. Yeah, anyway. yeah wish there was a world where quotas were needed. I agree with you, but it turns out I think they are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very controversial because people say, I don't want a quota. I, I, for women, we have women's programs. And, and women sometimes will show up in the program and say, I don't know why I'm here. My boss is making me take become on this program, and I was like, okay, like I don't. Where all the why? Why am I? Why are you trying to fix me? I was like, well, I'm not trying to fix you. I'm not trying to fix you. But you understand where this is coming from. What I find surprising, and I always say this, is that when I when I teach programs that are mostly men in them, which is most of our programs, just the nature of what it looks like at senior levels of companies, there's not a single man that I've ever met who said, "What am I doing here? I'm not broken." They're like, I'm a leader in my organization, right? I'm a high potential. That's what I'm doing here. And so I think there's a framing sometimes. Yeah. Is that a surprising thing to... Uh, really? Very surprising. Well, now that you say it, it suddenly, it dawns on me, it makes perfect sense. Like, if why, why, if, if I was sitting there as a, you know, in a woman in leadership program, I'd be going, why am I in a corporate finance program? Why am I in a leadership program? What, what's, what, why? But if I bring men into the same program, by the way, it's almost identical material, almost, and I bring men into that same program, they feel like they're getting special treatment, that they're a high potential, they've been designated, their boss thinks enough of them that they want to fast track them. This is an acceleration program, not a remedial program. Well, they're both acceleration programs. Of course they are. Um, of course they are. There is something though, I get it about, about being a woman in a mixed acceleration program that might feel different for the women. So I understand why the first instinct is to say, why am I being fixed? There is something about women's programs, and I can't help but put the, pl the plug in for this. There's something that sort of um, enables women to get to the core issues for them faster. Um, they get to it faster. 
there is a vulnerability that they can show much earlier because it's just us girls kind of idea, for lack of a better phrase. Um, and I and I so I do teach both mixed programs and women's programs. So I am able, and I have taught some just men programs. But I am we try to get away from this. But I am able to sort of see the differences in a willingness to take a risk, to try something, to express something. One of the things that gets expressed in the women's programs, they said many women will say, "Oh my gosh, I thought that was a." My problem, I didn't realize that this is a common experience for women. Well, that's very, if you think that this is something that has to do with you as an individual, a, a deficit you have, a, a problem, a challenge you, only you suffer from, that's very different from realizing like, oh my gosh, all 10 of you women have this issue or 30 of you women have dealt with this over the course of your career. That feels very different. You feel much more empowered to make some changes. Now, you might be discouraged that everybody's dealing with it, but, but, um, but we can have that conversation just more easily. Mm -hmm. in that so so we are always pushing for greater inclusion it's not it is gender it's not just gender it is race i mean that's the next it's also socioeconomic status you know unfortunately these wonderful institutions um you know people are certain kinds of folks choose them and certain kinds of folks are admitted to them and people with certain kinds of backgrounds are just more uh, I, I think it's more appealing people assume for companies to hire for hiring purposes and so that's another place we're really putting a lot of effort. Our laid law scholars are just incredible women um, who otherwise may not have had the opportunity or the, or the ability to pursue a degree here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a, it's a marvelous program. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's also, it's and just on the, yeah. the, the, the kind of LPS more general kind of forward, yeah. forever forward program, like a big portion of that is scholarship for disadvantages, it's, which is a wonderful Absolutely. Thing. I mean, we at LBS are so privileged to be here, but just our neighbors are, you know, the, the neighborhood of Listen Grove. I mean, it's it's quite a deprived area, quite a deprived area of London. And so it's right here. What can we do, I think, to as you're, as you're saying, the scholarships will help us reach out. Um, then we have to get the word out, right, that that we've got these fabulous people here. Um, yeah, anyway, they're, they're just a joy. And it's nice to see. I mean, there's been a lot of years when... To be really, to be really honest, I felt like my job was to teach privileged people how to be more effective, and you know, there's only yeah, there's only so much purpose yeah, that can serve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, as a former investment banker, I feel, <laughs> I, I feel I feel much better doing what I do right now on the environmental side. I fully understand I this. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. real purpose, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and this kind of thing. So I, yeah. I hear that as well. Yeah, easier to get out of bed in the morning if you feel like you're you're going, you're doing something good. Yeah, yeah. you're making a contribution. Absolutely, but mm. it, we're, we're talking along about mm. um, you know gender equality yeah. and also uh, racial. Diverse, uh, sure. diversity. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, your work on uh, allyship and intersectionality, and mm -hmm. particularly kind of thinking about how we might be able to kind of pull it into 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 climate? Like, is there is there a role for like climate uh, uh, allyship? Yeah, it's a really. I, I'm not sure I'll hit it exactly right. Um, allyship is really important. I think that there are these movements, and I know they're a little bit controversial. The UN has um, he for she, for instance, right? And that's about men standing up for the rights of women. I think some people find that controversial. Like, why do we women need, right, the men to stand next to us? And it's sort of, uh, it's about people in power helping those who have less voice. And I think that that's what allyship is, isn't it? That's all it is. And I think that we could, there's there's lots more work we could be doing there. I think it's hard though. I think, you know, the psychology of human beings is that we're more comfortable with people who are like us. I think that's obvious, right? I just taught today this, you know, the concept is birds of a feather flock together. And so, you know, I have more women in my network than you probably have, right? You have more investment bankers than I would have, right? All those kind. Of, you're a cyclist, you've got more cyclists. You're married, you've got more married people. Um, I think it's, it, it feels more comfortable. And so reaching across that kind of, we call those um, fault lines in a way, reaching across that fault line is hard. Knowing what to say is difficult. I mean, if I'm thinking about there, the climate issues affect all of us and, and the underserved more than anyone, right? If I think about the places that are getting hotter and people don't have the ability to move from those places, they don't have a second home they can kind of jet off to, they can't as easily. It affects everyone. It affects people in disadvantaged communities more than anybody. Um, but some of us who are in the majority, I think, don't feel as comfortable reaching out to those communities and don't feel, and there's a, there's a tension there between helping people own their power and helping support them with resources and then stepping in and kind of speaking for other communities. I don't know if I'm making this clear or not, but I think that that's one of the difficulties of allyship is that I want to be here to help you in the way that you want to be helped, the way that you need your voice to be heard. 
I, this the 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 woman from Barbados who spoke so so powerfully, you know, she shouldn't have to be a super inspirational speaker to get the world to say you have a need and we have to meet it. But this is the world in which in which we live. You know, it's interesting to me. I wonder about conversations around family dinner tables. Um, I don't know what yours are like. I know what mine are like. I think that there are real generational differences. So as I've you know as I've said, my kids are in their early twenties. And they feel the crisis of the climate. They feel it. They learn about it in school in a way that I think it wasn't present, certainly when I was in school. They feel a sense of urgency. I'm sort of squashed between my parents are, are in their late 70s and uh, late 70s. And, and I don't think they feel any of this climate pressure necessarily. I don't think that it's something it, you have to be a little bit forward, present minded and forward thinking. Um, and I don't think that they have that same sense of urgency. And so it's really about, I think, my generation, the generation two or three behind me, they're very, they're advocating. So the, so what I can, I can change my mind. I can change my behaviors. They're the ones who are encouraging me to buy an electric vehicle. They're the, now they want me to buy a Tesla and I'm not sure about that, but that's a whole different thing. Um, yeah, I, I think that there is allyship. And I think we as grownups with power should and could be doing lots more. I, I would love more direction. Would that be helpful? Sometimes I think you think, okay, well, I, I recycle. Is that enough? And you're like, that's not enough. I compost my food waste. That, that's not enough. I don't drive my car. I don't use a dryer. What else should I be doing? So sometimes it's about, maybe I'm, maybe I'm naive about this. What else do I need to do? It's about moving my investments, right? To more, right? To, and, and, and parking my, my investment money in places that are not polluting and companies that are not polluting the environment. I think it's probably going to be along those lines. And that's where an older generation can be very powerful, right? Mm -hmm. Because they hold resources like money and they have a voice. Um, and so I think they can be better allies. I think grandparents could be better allies for the environment for the, for the later generations. I don't know if that's a helpful answer yeah. or not, but I've learned a lot from my kids because their science curriculum looks very different and their social studies look very different from my curriculum growing up. Yeah, mm -hmm. these are these are issues that are front and center for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I know a member of my, I say he's a bit bigger now, but um, he was coming back uh, 10 years ago. He's, he's mm. 13 now, and mm. com coming back 10 years ago from school, um, being told about, you know, saving the polar bears. That's, yeah. That's, I, certainly, I was Nobody really, saved yeah. anything. No, no. <laughs> exactly. No, we went to the zoo and threw yeah, things at them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it was a totally <laughs> different. So I think that, that this generation seems very much, and again, you know better than I, seems really tuned into this issue and, and feels a sense of, of crisis. Um, influencing where their parents invest their money, right? Influencing Sometimes. who their parents vote for, making sure that, you know, these kinds of issues are at the top of the uh, top of the agenda. I think that's dinner table conversation. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's important. Yeah, yeah, and as, as you were saying before, the, um, if we can get into the businesses, like it's influencing the businesses, that that, that gets like two thirds Listen. of the problem sorted. So if, they, if that's what the grandparents can be doing, you know, that's-, that's ex I mean, that's honestly, yeah. if, you know, if you can get leaders of big companies, not just polluters, but, you know, financial institutions to decide that they're gonna make different decisions, right? Um, that will make a huge, that'll have a huge impact on the world. I don't think it's gonna be governments because I think they move slowly and they're accountable, but, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, I, I do think there's a huge role that business has to play. Yeah, although uh, something like the the, the, yeah. the Inflation Reduction Act act in the US, yes. Um, yes. that's a big step forward. It that's is, that is actually forward. a huge step yeah. forward. Yeah. yeah, it is a huge step forward. It is, what so you know the Inflation Reduction Act yeah. and I know the Inflation Reduction Act. But I'm not sure that even voters in the midterm could tell you three things that this administration has achieved in the, in the two years it's been, right, in the two years that the Democrats have held the White House. I'm not sure it could give you three major pieces of legislation, right, um, and the effect that they're going to have moving forward. That's a PR problem. That's a massive problem. I was in, in the U.S. a couple of weeks ago. I um, was in, in New York and I was just having some dinner dinner the night. Uh, TV was on. It was yeah. I just, just just head up. And the uh, the ads were continually why you shouldn't vote for the other guy, what he did. And then another ad going, why you shouldn't vote for that guy, what, what, what they did. They're terrible. And nothing about why you should vote for me. I get it. It's, it's a why. Well, we, it? well, there's a couple of things, right? We know that negativity moves people. So that's one. We know that saying something bad about someone moves people. People also like drama. I think they're really hooked on drama. It looks dramatic, and so they want. It's like, why do they watch these crazy television shows? It's all about the drama. But I also think that the the administrations and the parties themselves need to do a much better job of educating the populace about why they were pushing for this, what the effects are going to be, and then celebrating the successes of those things as they come up. And I think that maybe they're busy, but too often I think people are just not aware of how their lives are being positively affected, the lives of their grandchildren, um, and so they look like. 
I don't know. Yes. I mean, small wins, right? What is the John Cotter academic kind of idea is that you want to celebrate, when you want change to happen, you have to celebrate your small wins. Are we celebrating enough small wins? I mean, maybe that's part of it too. We need to be more positive in how we're approaching this. Maybe there aren't any small wins. I mean, maybe that's the problem that the temperature keeps climbing, so it's hard to have a party about that, you know? Yeah, and it's surely the both them, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans are doing what they think will win, and they're both doing pretty much the same thing, which is slagging off the other guy. Like, yes, for sure. So why is a more positive message not seen to be um, something that'll break through? Yeah, and surely so I think, you could be saying, "Listen, we've done this; it's amazing." <laughs> Look, yes, we're transforming the economy, guys. It's, you know, yes, all these new I, jobs. Yes, I guess part of it is that. Yeah, I, I, hundred percent. I think the ads themselves, the negativity seems to be driving people to come out. Right, they're angry; they're going to come out. But I do think there's just something in general about consistent messaging about about what the you know Inflation Reduction Act really is. I, I don't see it very often. Like here's all the things that are in, included in here, just from the administration. Just I don't do they use social media very much? I mean, I'd like to see them, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or or whatever it might be. I uh, yeah, I'd like to see them just tell us what's in it that I can grab onto and convince other people they should vote for you again because you've done this marvelous thing. Yes, I, I just don't see enough. I don't see enough. Uh, maybe it's because people don't like policies. They like horse races. Yeah, oh, and, people. <laughs> and people. Yeah. yeah people like people. Yeah. I know, like, since, um, have you ever heard of the uh, loan program office in the US? No. No. Uh, it was one of these things no one had ever heard of. And then they put in a new leader. A new leader. He was a former, um, former, for, like, he was an entrepreneur. And then, then yeah. he, he yeah. Ran, ran, ran a big fund. And he's on social media all the time. And now a lot of people have, have, have heard of this really obscure office that actually does an awful lot of work because there was a guy, there's a guy in there running it who's really good at social media. But this is yeah. it, right? I mean, this is so discouraging, Chris, because what you're really saying is it's not hard to draw the attention to it. But you have to understand how social media works and you have to decide that it's important for people to know what you're doing. Right. I think I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. right? And for you to put a face to it. Like he, also, he, he stands up in, front, people. in front of the camera, right. camera and he does a sigh. This right. is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. This is why it's important. And That's thought, right. That's and, right. But he's, he's really good in front of the camera, though. Like he's mm -hmm. he's he's succinct. He gets the point across, and he's like he's 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 very skilled at this. Like, so, yeah. the, United is a, the United States is a country of three three hundred fifty million people. You can find more than one guy. That's the thing too, yeah. right? You've <laughs> got to get. You're right, but it's not like there isn't a pool of people who can do it. But I think but I think you're right. Messen ha the right messenger is critical, and the right messenger who understands the various modes of getting the message out. And uh, I think I think it's essential. I think that we're all struggling. I mean, I, most issues are struggling from this. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't hear that many good messengers. I don't hear that many. I don't see that many people on the Sunday shows who are talking about these kinds of issues. And now my fear is that COVID put climate back. Right. Recessions are looming. Right. That's going to put climate back. I mean, in this country, we're going to move toward austerity pretty soon. And what is that going to mean for? I don't I don't know. I, I worry sometimes that it becomes the climate should be the number one priority and it's not. It just keeps sinking further and further down. But um, so just going back to the kind of the, some of the, the, the core ideas. Yeah. Do you and this I'm sorry, this is going to be quite a hard question. Mm -hmm. But do you think there's a link between um, the inequalities and the barriers that uh, women have been facing and people of color have been facing in the uh, in the workplace and the unsustainability of our of our business practices? I think that in general, inequality, growing inequality, economic inequality, and I don't think that's what you're talking about, maybe I can back into it, is a huge issue. And um, it's a huge, and we've, we've seen the backlash of that issue, right? That growing income inequality means people feel uncertain. When people feel uncertain, they tend to vote for authoritarian, right-wing authoritarians. Right-wing authoritarians are not necessarily predisposed to saving the economy, right? Um, is there, I don't know. I don't think so. So far, we haven't seen it. Maybe left-wing authoritarians might be more well, likely to. To save the economy, well, they, they will say they will do. But you know, right, anyone in any extreme always does tend to massively overpromise and say, we'll give you the world and it'll cost you nothing and everything will be all sun, sunshine and rainbows. They promise, they promise, they promise. And, and in any yeah, extreme, that's what they do. <laughs> you're right. The other, You're right. It's not a right-left issue. But the other thing is that... Uh, am I wrong in saying this is a very naive perspective? And I hopefully I'll answer the question at some point. But... Um, that sustainability climate change feels like a long term and it will extend, of course, it's like planting an acorn, right? When is that tree actually going to grow? It'll be well beyond your lifetime. And sustainability issues maybe have that flavor. It feels like, you know, I'm not going to see any benefit from this or I'm not. The benefit is so uncertain. It's so far away that it's easier to tackle something that's much more urgent and immediate, right? That, it, that I do wonder, I think climate crisis is urgent. 
but somehow something else feels a little bit more urgent. And so our politicians, of course, are worried about the next year, two years, three years, four years. They're not necessarily worried about the next kind of 10 years or 25 years. I don't know if that's true or not, but it, I do wonder about that sometimes. That sustainability climate crisis seems like a very long term. You have to make changes today that may not um, have an impact for quite a while, but I could be wrong. For example, you, you do, like in the Inflation Reduction Act, you do have uh, large areas which are which have got big amounts of investment for the producing of, gig, of gigawatt battery ba batteries, yeah. electric cars, building up whole new industries, which will have a pretty yes, new, I like, get that. A, a, one, a one, two, three year impact right Fair here, enough. Right that now. was the green, yeah. the, all this green sort of economy mm. stuff, right? That you can actually do all of this at one time. Fair enough. I wonder if that's a bias that people have about that. If they're not really familiar with all the policies, they come in thinking if it's a climate crisis, sustainability issues, it feels much more long term and it feels beyond what's powerful for the individual, right? What's beyond the power of the individual? That individual that I, that I mentioned is now run the loan programs office. One of the one of the messaging he always had yeah. um, was this is the greatest wealth wealth creation opportunity um, yeah. of this generation. Like, and people need to think about it as yes. it's a real opportunity. That's right. If we get it, get involved in it, and I think more and more people are seeing it now as yes. the world is changing against big, big tech, big tech, mm -hmm. whatever. But that's if that messaging can be gone yeah. at a little, little bit more, you. it's it could have an impact. Yeah, you're right. And the counter messaging and the and the or the accompanying message is about how much money the government, certainly in the U.S., and that's our example we we're using spends subsidizing energy, right? Subsidizing other oil and gas. I mean, they're, they're, you know, I, I, I've heard criticism of, well, you know, you're gonna have to subsidize these, these, you know, these other kinds of energy sources. And it's like, well, it's already subsidized. I mean, you just, you just don't have the information, right? You're, you know, that's a problem. Um, do I see a, a link between um, the difficulties and hurdles that women and other minority groups face and sustainability. Yeah, maybe if I kind of frame slightly differently. Yeah. Um, what do you think that the impact of greater diversity in a board would be or in, in management leadership would be on the approach to sustainable um, uh, companies? Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so maybe that is the better way for me to think about it. So. So I think one is that the more diversity there is. So I think we make an assumption that gender or racial or socioeconomic diversity will bring a diversity of thought. And that's not always true, but 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 people's experience, lived experiences matter and they shape our view of the world, right? So my experience in the world may look slightly different from yours and somebody else's may look very different from ours. So I think when people are empowered in the table to have those conversations, they will bring different kinds of perspectives. They're having different conversations um, with their friends and their family. So will it change the path of sustainability, decisions that are made inside the organization? I think they could. I think consumers have a huge impact to play as well. So, so we get back to who's got the power, who's got all the money, you know what I mean? Like, can, can a more diverse board make a difference? Probably, yeah, because you see things differently, you're willing to challenge. That, that, that's not a fact, that's an opinion, that's an, that's an outdated assumption, that's not true anymore. What, my, what I know is true is that this is what's going on, not what that's what's going on. I just think challenging assumptions is kind of a fundamental thing that boards can do when they have their conversations about things. Again, a lot of it is going to be about consumers. It's going to be about regu regulations or that, that uh, reporting. You know, what we have to do here at London Business School, and I'm sure you know this, is that we've got to track our carbon. We've got to look at our environmental, the effect, the impact of our decisions on the environment here. Um, obviously, it's not inside my domain. I'd have better language for it. Um, but those kinds of things make a difference to companies, right? They have to make a difference. I mean, I was talking to somebody in a big consulting firm recently, and they were supposed to have a big, they were taking a big trip to one of the European capitals, and they were going to send 200, you know, 200 employees were going to go. Yeah, they're not going. They're not going. Because they said not only it is expensive and a recession is coming, our clients are going to go through a recession. They don't want to see us spending all this money like it's like we're drunken sailors. But also, it's really bad for our for our climate numbers. We're 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 trying to we're, our website is all about the climate, and we're not living to it. So those things all make a difference. Now, was that a board decision, a senior management decision? It may have been. Was it the idea that they were a little bit nervous about how their clients, potential clients, were going to judge some of their decision making? It definitely was. Yeah, well, and was that individual on board of that idea? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Said that you're absolutely right. I mean, we cannot be seen loading hundreds of people. Slightly different. <laughs> What's that? We cannot be seen, or whether whether we cannot be, or we cannot be seen to. Two two completely different concepts. Yeah, and yet sometimes they can have the same outcome. Oh, sure. And sure. so I hear yeah. you. I know. Yeah. I, listen, 
I'd rather everybody was passionate about this issue, but if they're not going to be passionate, they're at least going to be responsive to other people's passions. And I think that that's okay. I may not be passionate about some direction of a regulation, but the regulation will make me move in that direction anyway, right? You provide the right incentives and we'll all do it, right? So if my clients won't come to me and it won't line my pot and I won't have the same bonus at the end of the year, it's okay if I'm not there yet. Do you know what I mean? Like the climate doesn't care why I'm doing it. It just wants me to stop getting on jet planes and flying around. I don't know, but maybe not. I mean, but I do think that you want some people who are advocates and passionate, and you want other people to just stop doing bad things. Yeah, no, no, for sure, for sure. And I guess that kind of brings it kind of neatly to your kind of thinking on authenticity, the importance of authenticity in the workplace. I'm kind of a different <laughs> on authenticity. Have I said this before? Have you seen this from me? Can we talk about um, small experiments in high value behaviors, please? Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, what about it? I'm happy to talk about experiments. I'm happy to talk about authenticity. Yeah. Um, but okay, as this, as a kind of strategy for someone who is in a workplace that may or may not kind of, that doesn't quite mesh with their, 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 their frames of the world. Great. Yeah, we have an attitude here at London Business School in our degree programs, so, but more than, more than that in our executive ed programs, that the only way you're going to transform organizations is if leaders transform themselves and their teams. And so what I mean by that is, and the vehicle for doing that, the mechanism is experimentation. So, you know, I can't change a particular organization, but I can change what's in my control. And so oftentimes, you know, there's a, there's a great little Venn diagram that I stole from someplace that's got these two circles and it's what I control and what's important. And there's that space in the middle. And people control a lot of things at work, even their middle managers, they control it. And then they have to decide what's important. And sometimes it's it's not just what's in my KPIs, it's what's important to me as a human being. And that could be how I take care of my people, it could be about the environment. And there's that overlap. And so are there small experiments you can run? Could you try things? Yeah, in my degree course, right now, the students are working on their what if assignment. And the what if assignment is taking some concept from class and going into, into work and they have a hypothesis. If I do this, then this will happen. So you can have you can deal with anything you want in this with that kind of language. So if I, you know, go with a different vendor, then this will happen. If I enable my people to come up with ideas for how they want on sustainability for this month, we're going to deal. This year is the year of climate change. What are we going to do inside of our own team to support climate action? If I do this with my people, then this will happen. If I recognize and celebrate when someone does the right thing when it comes to climate action at work, whatever that is, and you should tell me what that could look like, some ideas about what that could look like, then I, if I reward it, I will get more of it. If we get more of it, then that will reduce our waste, If whatever it might be, right? So I love the idea of experiments. I think, I think people are more likely to do something different if they think it's an experiment than if they I think it's a project or I don't know initiative. I just think there's something about experiments that yeah. means that you can not find success and you learn something. You keep moving. Yeah, again, it's the power of language. It's, yeah, it's, it's always power. the power. It's always the power of language. And what we also want people to do is every day or as often as possible think about how I could do things slightly differently and challenge why you're doing it the way that you did it. And that maybe that's the that's the climate story as well. If I could change one small thing, if I can mm. experiment with walking to work you know, leaving my car at home one more day a week, what would that mean? If I leave my car at home, then this will happen, right? I will feel better about my, right, about my contribution to climate change or what, I don't know what it's gonna be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? No, of course, right. So that's a you know, really, really, really great insight. Uh, conscious that we're running a bit short on time, so just, did, yeah, uh, just a couple of things I'd uh, like to, uh, to, to wrap sure. up with. One is, I don't think I could let you go without asking you about your shift model. As oh, I think yeah, it's wonderful. Happy to. Yeah, yeah, and if you uh, could just talk, 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 yeah, talk sure, uh, sure. a little bit about that, sure. and then finally, I'll just ask you for a, a little bit of advice for 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 kind of our, our LBS um, fraternity. But uh, but but first, if you just tell us a little bit about, about your yeah. shift model. So this is a model I put together a few years ago that was based on some of the research I was doing and some of the research that exists in negotiation, and it really is a, you know, it's a it's a very easy model for knowing how to negotiate, right? So it's it's five letters and it tells you everything you need to know. So one of the things I have to preface, I should preface this by saying is, you know, don't tell Francois because he he pays us to teach a semester's worth of this kind of stuff, you know? And the course is marvelous. And one of our actually most popular electives at LBS is the negotiation elective. Um, and it's because most of it is practice and it's marvelous. And there's lots of debrief in the classroom. So it's a wonderful course. And you could also have the shift model at your fingertips. So shift stands for separate interests from positions. So someone comes at you and says, I want, um, I want to go to uh, Miami 
for a summer ho- for our winter holiday, and that's a position. If you ask me why I want to go to Miami, then that's those are my interests. I want a sunnier climate. I want to um, go dis, you know, go to the clubs. I want a high energy kind of place to visit. Well, if I know those are three things that you want, I might suggest another place we go to, right? Maybe it'll be Austin, Texas. Maybe it'll be San Juan, Puerto Rico. So separate the interests from the positions because there are lots of ways to skin a cat. Here, the other side is that negotiation really is about understanding where the other party is coming from, to understand what their interests are. And so you're always asking questions and you're trying to listen for their answers so I can under, so you can understand what their underlying interests really are, where, where some of the sensitive sore points are, where some of the backstops might be. So for instance, um, I often, uh, as an example of why this is so important, I often will have negotiators actually prop up their phones and, and video record themselves negotiating. And what they will see is when they're talking, they're looking up. When the other person's talking, they're looking down. They're not really listening. They're not really, I mean, they're trying to do a little bit, but they're really thinking about the next thing they want to say, right? That's what we as humans do. And, you know, so the, the old saying is, you know, you've got two ears and one mouth. You should listen twice as much as you talk. So that's, that's here the other side. I is invest in the relationship. It's amazing um, how much more we're willing to give to somebody, even when it's painful, when it's someone that we care about. Even rational people who do deals for a living will often hold back more from someone they don't like or give a little bit more to someone that they like, right? It's just human nature, right? So we tend to be a little bit more generous if we like someone. So the more we invest in the relationship, the more the other side likes us, the more they might give us, the more they trust us, the more questions they might ask us, right? The harder they may work. So that's an important one for moving um, the conversation forward. Uh, F is for frame the negotiation as a problem to be solved. This is research I did very early in my career where I gave, two groups of people, the same negotiation exercise, the same details, but for one group it was called a negotiation, and for the one it was was a problem-solving task. And everything about the exchange was different, right? So uh, people who were told they were going to be negotiating anticipated um, disliking the other party more, they were less optimistic about the possibility of getting a deal, they, when they came into the room, where do you think they put their chairs when they were thought it was a negotiation? Where did they put their chairs? Face, uh, yeah, start negotiating uh, face by face, side by side, I thought it was problem solving, yeah. Side by side. And it's amazing yeah. how, yeah, it changes <laughs> everything about how much you're willing to share, what you're willing to let go of. You're much more focused on actually a, sol- a problem to be solved. And I would say most negotiations are a shared problem to be solved. It's a shared problem. To, if I didn't need you and I could share, solve this problem on my own, you wouldn't be here. Right, so we obviously need something from one another. So, so oftentimes people who don't like to negotiate, if they think of the negotiation instead as a problem to be solved between the two of them, they're much more likely to approach the negotiation and actually bring some creativity to that. And in fact, I would, and you know, you had a career before this. You know, you don't use the word negotiate a lot in your negotiations because it mostly some of the work that I've research I've done, people kind of get protective and aggressive when they use the word negotiation. They think they have to kind of protect themselves because they might get exploited. It raises a whole bunch of interesting, um, it's language again. Mm. The word negotiation makes people feel like, um, yeah, that there's going to be some concessions. And when it's a problem to be solved, it's just you and me putting our heads together. But you still call it the elective negotiation. We do, we call it, nego- I didn't name it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's always what, been what, 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 what would you call it? Uh, I think I still call it negotiation because it's hard. But when I deal with you, I wouldn't call it negotiation, right? Okay. There's just a few details I need to iron out with you. I think the equivalent course in Yale is called influence. <laughs> yeah, we also have influence. You could use influence. I don't like influence. I'll tell you why. Because I think because so the negoti- there's other negative connotations to that as well. Doesn't yeah. it? Mm-hmm. It's about getting my way. And actually, it's about that we always, as human beings, want to strike the balance between advocacy and inquiry. And advocacy is influence, and that's trying to get you to change your mind. Inquiry is, is more trying to understand. And I think that inquiry is actually a huge piece of it. I think if there was a little bit less influence and a little bit more listening, a little less advocacy and a little bit more inquiry, I think you'd have breakthroughs more often. But if you're advocating all the time, you're not really listening, right? You got to you gotta understand before you can actually formulate the solution that's going to work for the other party. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just jamming them up with, with arguments. Hmm. Um, anyway, uh, and then T is through creatively. Because I, I said before, I, I think creativity is at the heart of all of it, right? So, yeah, the blue sky. 
right? Break free of, I want this and you want this and we'll meet in the middle. And instead think about, it's a fresh sheet of paper. What would we do differently? How would we do? I can't promise you that we're going to do that, but let's start the thinking, right? Let's start the, and you're watching. Like, what are they, what are they throwing up on the wall that they really care about? Oh, that's telling me something about your interests. Where do they get a really strong negative reaction when you try to push a point? Oh, that's something that they don't want, right? Easy stuff like this. But you're trying to think creatively. You're trying to find the white space where a deal might be possible where a solution to the problem might be found. Mm -hmm. oh, brilliant, yeah. It's, it's slightly contrary to what what's like game theory would suggest, where you're just trying to put down numbers and trying to get, you know, the, the optimal the optimal numerical outcome based yeah, on your wishes theory, yeah. for... Because a prisoner's dilemma game... So, so, so game theory is an approach to negotiation, but of course there's, there's, there's in, a, in a typical prisoner's dilemma, there's no shadow of the future. Negotiation typically is a shadow of the future. Now, if there's if, if you and I are only going to negotiate once about your about the used car, you know I'll use all the numbers and I'll do all. I don't care. I'm trying to win, right? It's single issue price, and I'll never see you again. That's a very specific kind of negotiation. The COP 27 marriages. Most negotiations are actually not of that flavor, right? There is a shadow of the future, um, and and one of the th there's a number of things that game theory leaves out. One is communication, but you and I talk and we look at each other, and I decide I like you and I want you to I want you to do well and you persuade me that you need something in a way that that I'm persuaded by you can change my belief about who has more power in this negotiation me or you by the way you show up and the kinds of things that you say game theory doesn't account for that right mm -hmm. game theory doesn't account for that which is why a lot of uh, e economists call themselves behavioral economists now which I just call them psychologists <laughs> they're just experimental psychologists but they prefer to be called behavioral economists uh, but but that's where now all of a sudden it's about experimentation there there are more than just two options it's not just cooperative defect and you and I can actually coordinate around whether we're going to cooperate or defect, right? Because we have, can have a conversation about it. I can come into the negotiation saying, I can't wait to sit down with you. I really want to work with you. And I think there's, I think we can do something really powerful here. And I can raise your expectations about the possibility that a deal can be met. And that will change the course of our negotiation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Cool. And a very last question, if I might. Yeah, um, so normally trying to ask uh, for a little bit of advice uh, to 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 our audience, like kind of particularly looking at people, kind of young leaders, mm -hmm. people or people just leaving leaving their MBA. Yeah. Um, about so your your particular fields, like yeah. why do you think that? Um, what advice should we give them for getting into this field? Um, in this field, and why should they do it? Like why would it make Which a difference? Which field? I'd be, I'd be, I'd be behavioral science. Oh, oh my gosh, because <laughs> knowing more about how people think and what people think and uh, enables you to predict what people are going to do. And that just makes you more effective. I mean, that goes with this point about making people more effective. I think my advice, I, I don't know that I tell everybody to go get a PhD in social psychology. I'm not sure that's a great path for everybody, but, but, but having some basic psychology in your toolkit is extremely helpful for again people are it's what it's what Dan Ariely calls predictably irrational predictably irrational you there's a there's 150 biases out there that we use to make decisions we're all using the biases and there are ways that you can kind of leverage those if you wanted to right how do you and, and, and people in consumer, in marketing, and consumer behavior do this kind of stuff all the time. They know exactly how they should price something, right? Is it more powerful to price something at four ninety nine or at five pounds, right? When people, you know, is that kind? Of, that's like, that's just psychology, right? So I think it's a really powerful thing. I would say, um, I would also say that um, negotiate more, negotiate more. Um, that life really is about negotiating and negotiating not to win, but to better understand where someone else is coming from. Perspective taking is actually the key to doing to, to negotiating. It's taking another person's perspective, understanding what their interests are, and then using your creativity to come up with something that will work for both of us. And so negotiation, not as kind of a bludgeon, you're bludgeoning the other side to make concessions to you, but really to understand what's at issue. Um, and, 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 that, and that kind of insight into the other side's interests are what separates really um, good solutions, sustainable solutions from other kinds of agreements. Incredible. Yeah. I have a million more questions. I could talk, right. could talk to you all day, but uh, thank you for enormously uh, generous uh, of your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so, so, so yes. much. 
Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us on that conversation. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope that you uh, learned something. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and uh, to subscribe to, uh, to any of our channels. And uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. This series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club.